want to pick up uh, Pastor Skip's message on faith to reap. And for the last couple of weeks, you know, he's been really pouring his heart out to us. And last week in particular had a special effect on my heart for so many different reasons. You know, because I live with a consciousness every day that people live and die and never even enter into the first phase of what God has for them. And it's a travesty. And so his message last week was just so impactful for me. And I think that what was really powerful is that, you know, he brought up at the very beginning of the message what the Lord said to him. And that was, there must be a generation that excels in reaping. There must be a generation that excels in reaping. And that statement alone tells me that God has been watching generation after generation after generation plant seed, plant seed, plant seed, but failing some kind of way to reap a harvest. And so he said there must be a generation that excels in reaping. And I believe that we are that generation. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so as I've been thinking and, and meditating on this sermon series, Faith to Reap, about halfway through it, because Pastor Skip has been doing this since April, whether you all believe it or not, you have been getting installments since April. Your faith has been built up since April on the subject of reaping. And, um, you know, one of the things that about midway through, the Lord said to me, I want you, there's some things I want you to address. And I thought Pastor Skip had kind of addressed it just a little bit. But as I, you know, listened to some of the sermon, I realized that it wasn't exactly what the Lord had put in my heart. And so why is it important for us to reap? Why is that important? And it's important for several reasons. Number one is because it's the law. In Pastor Cheryl's message, she pulled out that verse of scripture that the Lord said to us, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and there will be harvest time. And so God is saying, this is a law. And for uh, us to be talking about reaping, you have to understand that there is a law in place that God is expecting us to live by. A law is the effect of a particular natural or scientific phenomenon that always occurs if certain conditions are present. And if a condition is present and the corresponding effect of that condition isn't present, somewhere that law has been broken. And as it relates to sowing and reaping or what's better known as the law of reciprocity, you give something and there is an obligation to reciprocate. But if you give or sow and don't have the corresponding effect of reaping, the law which God instituted has been broken. There's a violation of the law, if you will, if only half of it is in operation. As, as Pastor Skip said several weeks ago, it's a two-sided coin. We all know if we received a quarter and only one half of it is embossed that something's wrong, we would have a counterfeit. You can't take a, store, a coin into a store that only has one side of it embossed. Both sides have to be embossed for that coin to have value. Amen? The same holds true as it relates to the laws that govern sowing and reaping. You have to have both sides of the coin. In fact, in every country in the world, if a violation of the law, I'm sorry, in every country of the world, if there is a violation of the law, the one violating or breaking the law has to suffer the consequences even if they don't realize that they broke the law. Yesterday, a man named Nicholas Qatar, he was a tourist in the United Kingdom. And he was arrested and fined 845 pounds, which is $1,091.83 for spitting his gum on the ground in the UK. He didn't know, he didn't realize that it was a law, but he found out that it was yesterday. <laughs> Understand this, the law doesn't stop working because you don't know that it's not in effect. 
My son Quentin, a few years ago, went to Japan. And when he got to Japan, you know, he came home and he was shocked to find out that according to Article 1.2 of the Japanese Minor Offense Act, spitting in a park is a violation. Now see here, that doesn't mean anything to us. Gum on the floor, gum on the shoe. You know, I have a quick story. You talk about where people put gum. My son Kyle, when he was a little boy, you know, about the age of my grandson Jalen, he was about a year and a half old. And I was pregnant with Kayla, and we had taken Kyle to Denny's, and we walk into Denny's, and when Kyle was a little boy, when he would chew, he would make the yum-yum sound. And so whenever he would chew, he would go, mm -hmm. And so we went into this store, into the Denny's, and we didn't give him anything. Well, by the time we got seated and we're waiting for the, the, the waitress to come, Kyle is in the restaurant. Mm, I'm talking about yum, yum into the 10th power. Mm, 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 mm. And I looked to Pastor Skip. I said, what did you give him? He said, I didn't give him nothing. I said, you had to give him something. He's chewing something. He said, I didn't give him nothing. I pried Kyle's mouth open only to be disgusted to find that Kyle had pulled wads of gum from under the table. <laughs> and was yum yum into town. So see, we don't have gum law in the United States. It doesn't mean anything to us. But in Japan, Quentin found out that you could go to jail for spitting in a park. So just because you don't know that a law is in effect, it doesn't mean that you get a pass to ignore or violate it. If you violate the law, you will suffer the consequences. So it's important that we learn and understand the laws of sowing and reaping and then do all that we can to ensure that we're operating as law-abiding citizens in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Another, re another reason reaping is important is because when a harvest has grown to its full measure, it's reaping time. And sometimes that harvest can get very tall. And a farmer understands that when that harvest gets tall, it's time to go out there and pull that harvest in. I was reading about a son who had a father who suddenly passed away. And his father was a farmer in the, right here in the state of Wisconsin in the town of Milton. And this man died and he had a lot of uh, corn and soybean crops. And so the corn had grown up to about 12 feet tall and it needed to be brought in. And so the neighboring farmers came together and they all strategized on ways that they were going to harvest this man, bring this man's harvest in. And the media uh, uh, interviewed one of the farmers and asked him, why did you all take the time? to pull in this man's harvest. He said for two reasons. One, these are good people. The second reason he said is because if the corn stays out in the field too long, it will dry up. Amen. You see what Pastor Skip, Pastor Cheryl, and what we as the neighboring farmers have been trying to say to you is if you don't make your move and get out into your harvest fields of life, pulling in what rightfully belongs to you, your harvest could potentially dry out. And we don't want that. Amen? Amen. So what's needed? What do we need to, it, to do to ensure that our harvest doesn't dry out? I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Long before harvest times comes, you have to have a mindset that understands the importance of reaping. Meaning, you have to have harvest always on your mind. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're going, no matter how it is that you are in life, you have to be thinking about your harvest. Consider this. When a farmer plants seed, he does it with the harvest in his mind. When he purchased the seed, most of the time, the harvest he desired had a picture on the front of the bag of seeds that he ordered, or it had a picture in the catalog. The catalog and the outer bag helped paint a picture inside that farmer. So when he gave his credit card or his money, he knew what he was ordering. Although he paid for seeds, in his mind, he was really buying corn. He was really buying watermelons. 
he saw the potential of that seed within him. He didn't make a blind purchase. He was fully aware of the type of crop he would receive if he planted what he purchased. It wasn't a mystery to him. Corn on the bag meant corn in the field. Soybeans on the bag means soybean in the field. See, in this place, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied, won't do. Amen. The farmer is totally committed to the outcome of that seed. And no farmer, no sower, no harvester engages with a seed without simultaneously finding his or, self, his or herself mentally engaging with the harvest. I'm going to say it again. No farmer, no harvester, no one engages with seed and not at the same time doesn't mentally engage with that harvest. He has a mindset to reap. When he's placing his order for the seed, he's thinking about the harvest. He can see the harvest. Remember what God said. He said, there must be a generation that excels in reaping. We're that generation. Look at your neighbor and say, we're that generation. If you don't clearly understand, like the neighbors of that farmer, that when a harvest gets tall, 12 feet tall, that when harvest comes, that there's something required of you, that you've got to get out there and pull it in. See, the funny thing about harvest time is that you can feel it. I was sharing with the first service that, you know, a couple of days ago, I came into the service and I didn't have my sleeves out. Today, I got up looking for wool pants and a sweater. Why? Because things have changed. The leaves on the trees are about to change. Harvest time doesn't catch you by surprise. We all understand because God said as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and there will be harvest time. But if you don't have a mind to reap, you'll watch as things around you change, but you won't take place in the change. Nothing will change in your life. Too many people have in their heart, and they understand, and they know that God has things for them. They long and yearn to have the place and the position of blessing that God has laid aside for them. They daydream and they imagine themselves living in abundance and success. They can see it and sometimes they can feel it. But somewhere there is a disconnect between that dream and what they bring about. Somewhere something is not connecting. But what you got to know about God is that it's his desire that whenever you plant a seed that you receive a harvest. He's the one that said as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and there's going to be harvest time. This whole business of sowing and reaping was instituted by God. Why would he institute a law and then work overtime not to see it come to pass in your life? The way that Pastor Skip has been sharing with us since April takes a certain mindset to reap takes a certain mindset. And one thing I know is this, that the only difference between people who are reaping and those who are not is the way you think. That's it. That's the only thing that's different. It's the way you think. Somebody said to me, but it's also the words of your confession, but you can't have words of confessions unless they first come in your mind. There must be a generation that excels in reaping. There must be a generation that understands that just as God desires to give me seed to sow, he desires to give me bread to eat. 
Amen. Amen. To live the kind of life that God desires for you and I to live, we're going to have to think differently. It's not an outside force keeping you from reaping. It's an inner force that's put a lid on where you can go and how far you can grow. You're doing it to yourself. To live in the kind of life that God desires for you and that God has designed for you, you have to have a mind to reap, meaning your mind has to anticipate it at all times. You have to be thinking about the harvest of your blessing at all times. Everything you do, you've got to think before I do that, what kind of harvest is that going to produce in my life? Is this going to add or take away from the quality of my life? You got to get comfortable with having a harvest mindset and you can't be afraid of it. Something in you must be unwilling to settle for the absence of the harvest that God has for you. Some people won't understand you. They'll think that you're about things, but that's not it. It's not that we're about things, but we're about living to our maximum potential to do what God has called us to do. Do you hear me today? It's an aggressive, unwilling mindset. It's an aggressive, unwilling mindset. It's an aggressive and willing mindset. It's an aggressive and a willing mindset. And it understands that it's not just been mandated to reap. It's been pre-programmed to reap. God hardwired that into your spirit to reap every time you sow and to live your life not being conscious of it. You only got one side of the coin, baby. And he's saying there must be a generation that excels in reaping. But if you don't have a reaping mindset, all you have is a sowing. I just got to give. I just got to give. But I never expect anything. See, I know what I'm talking about. I was one of those ones that all I would do is, no, 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 no. Let me bless you. And then when somebody would try to turn around and bless me, I wouldn't receive the blessing. Let, let, let me just, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I held on to a check. Somebody gave me a check for $5,000. Can you say $5,000? $5,000. Thousand dollars. You know what I did with that check? I put it in my purse and I held on to it for a month and a half. Because I wanted to make sure that the person that gave it to me could afford to give it to me. And if they had a need, then I wouldn't I, I would get turned around and, and, and bless them back. I didn't know how to receive. You hear what I'm saying? There must be a generation that excels in reaping. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 2, 28 rather. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 29, it says this, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect and with a... What does that say? Come on, come on. Serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. Why? Why do I need to serve God with a perfect heart and a mind that's willing? Here's why. For the Lord searches the hearts. And he understands that everything that man imagines, images, dreams, thinks about. He knows what's in you. He knows the dreams that you have. He said, but you got to have a mind that's willing to carry out what you see in your spirit. Then he goes on to say, he said, and if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. In other words, if you forsake what I'm putting on the inside of you, and if you don't have a mind that's willing to carry out what I put on the inside of you, you're going to be cast off. Have you ever seen people shuck corn? Have you ever seen people uh, reap a harvest? What they cannot, what's not useful, what's died, the harvest that's died, you know what they do? They cut it off. They cut it off. 
And that's not the case with you and me. That's not how it's going to be with you and I. Every seed that we have sown, that God desires to bring about in our lives in this day, in this season, in this generation, in this hour, we got to be committed to get it. Amen? Amen. There are many things that can hinder us from having a mind that's willing to step out and receive all that God has for us. And I'm going to name just a few because some of them can be thoughts of fear that are designed to limit you. It's there to put a glass ceiling over your life. You can see out of it, but you can't obtain it. It immobilizes you and stops you from pulling in what God has promised you. You know, and the thing about the glass ceiling is that it does not move from the outside in. It only moves from the inside out. It has to be pushed up. It can't be pushed down so anybody on the outside can't get you out. You have to pull yourself out of this one. Thank you, Jesus. So when you allow the things that I'm about to share with you to stop you, you won't produce fruit. And when you don't produce fruit, God doesn't get glory out of your life. Let's look at John, the 15th chapter, verse number seven. We always use this verse in connection with prayer, and it is talking about prayer, but he's talking about living a fruitful harvest field life. Look at what he said. He said, if you abide in me, talking about the word, and my word abides in you, you can ask me for whatever you will. And I'll do it, is what he's saying. And it will be done for you. My Father in heaven will do it for you. He said, and when, hold it, stay there. He said, and when you ask me for something and you get it, look at what happens in verse 8. That's when my Father will get the glory. When you harvest is when the Father gets glory. The Father gets no glory by you just planting the seed. The glory comes to the Father when you plant the seed and you reap the harvest. That's when God gets the glory. How many of you want God to get glory out of your life? Then you must be the generation that excels in reaping. So let's look at some of these things, some of these things that can stop us from excelling in life and, and reaping our harvest. Number one, I said it a minute ago, fear. Say fear. F-E-A-R, fear. F -E -A -R, fear. You can, fear will stop you from going after what you see on the inside of you like Pastor Skip was talking about. Fear will stop you. Thoughts like, what will happen if it doesn't work? My answer to that is, what happens if it does work? See, it's just, it's just, it's a question on this side, it's a question on that side. But which one is going to be stronger? The one that I'm going to look at. And what if it doesn't work? What if it does work? What if it doesn't work? What if it does work? What, what if it, what if it doesn't work? What if it does work? Same number of words. Same number of words. What if it does work? But because we're so gripped by fear many times, we stay on this side of the fence. When God is saying, come on over to this side of the fence so you can reap your harvest. Amen. Amen. What happens? What, what, they want me to do this and I'm not educated enough. I'm not smart enough. My skin is not light enough. All of the lies of the enemy. You know, and just real quick, you know, they, they're talking about the credit. I want y'all to know the credit score don't mean jack no more. It don't mean nothing no more. When you can go to places like Fair.com and Carvana and get you a car and you don't even have to have a good credit no more, they don't care nothing about that credit report. So what if I go for it and they, and, they, and they won't let me do it because my credit is bad? What if they do? I'm going to share this story. I shared it with the first one. Y'all getting ahead of me. Just wait a minute. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I got a call from someone, a, a, a multi-million dollar corporation. And a woman called me and she asked me, she said, I want to meet with you. And uh, I said, okay, yeah, sure, you can. You can meet with me. And so I went to lunch with her and her assistant. And when I'm sitting at the table, I walked in. I was as nervous as they come. 
fear just bombarding my brain. What if I, what if I, you know, they want to give some money? What if I, I don't answer the questions the right way? And, and what if I, I, I'm not articulate enough? And, and what if I, if they think that what I'm doing is not good enough? And, and what if I, you know, they get, you know, what, what happens, you know, this fear that I don't want people to get close to me because if they get close to me, then they're going to see that there's, there's things that are not perfect about me. And, and so I'm not going to let people get close to me. And, and, and what's going to happen if I, if I do this and, and I get in there and so I went in there all of those thoughts bombarded my brain I got in there I was a nervous wreck because it's scientifically proven that when you give place to your thoughts that like that that what you do know moves to the back of your head moves to the back of your head and what you don't know comes to the front so if you don't know nothing then that's what sits at the front of your brain and so here she asked me one question, a question that I've been quoting for 12 and a half years. What is your vision? I couldn't tell the woman what my vision was because fear had gripped my heart. And I walked out of there like a little puppy with his tail tucked between his legs saying, Lord, I done messed this up for World Outreach Center. I done messed this up for Melvin Henderson ministry. Here somebody wants to bless us, and I didn't even have the goods to do it. Went home just feeling bad, and so I called a friend. I said, this is what happened. And, and my friend said to me, here's what you do. Send an email and say, is there any additional information that I, that I can give you about our vision? Is there anything else I can share with you? I sent that email, I, and I told her, I said, I just didn't feel like I, I didn't do it right. I didn't tell you what my vision was, and I promise you I know what my vision is. <laughs> but I did that afraid. I got a response back from her almost immediately, sent it on a Sunday. She said, I don't, I don't answer emails on Sundays. She said, but I saw that the email came from you. She said, I want you to know that when I left that meeting with you, she said, your life blessed me. She said, I want to work together. I want to do some things together with you. And I hung up. I mean, I closed out that email. I was like, thank you. <laughs> but what if I had not sent that email? Fear will steal your harvest. Steal. Fear was trying to steal my harvest. I do. <laughs> Let me tell you another one. Lies of the enemy. That God will bless them, but he ain't going to bless you. That God will do it for them, but he ain't going to do it for you. Lies of the enemy will steal your harvest. That God will increase them because they pray more, they fast more, because they preach more, because they have more influence. They, they have all of this, but he ain't going to do that for you. It's a lie that's trying to steal you from reaping your harvest. Another thing, thoughts of unworthiness. For some reason, we think in this space, I'm fundamentally flawed. I got some problems. And because I got problems, I can't excel above my problems. When I was a little girl or when I was a little boy, the things that happened to me won't let me, won't let me go any further than where I am. I'm, I'm flawed. And like I said earlier, and if, if people got to know me, they wouldn't want to be in relationship with me. One time I met a woman, a, 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 a doctor. She and her husband were doctors. And I met them at an event. And we're sitting together. And she said to me, she said, I'm looking for a really good church. Out of the blue. She said to me, I'm looking for a really good church home. Do you know any churches? I said, well, there's Elmbrook, Eastbrook, Epicos. Said everybody's church but my own. Why? Because 
I think I'm fundamentally flawed. I think they're going to get in here and they're going to see things that are wrong and they're not going to want to stay. I don't feel worthy. They'll steal your harvest. Here was two people, a family, a harvest. Here's another one. Guilt and shame. I done messed up so bad. I've done things wrong for so long. God can't use me. Oh, yes, he can. He used David, an adulterer. He used Solomon, an idolater. He can use you. Here's the next one. Feelings of being disloyal. If I do it, am I going to be disloyal to the people that I'm in relationship with? If I, if I go beyond where I am, am I going to leave the people that I'm with behind? And how are they going to feel about me? Oh, I know what I'm talking about. You ain't got to agree with me. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Am I being disloyal? God it wants to open doors for me, but I keep closing the doors because I, I, got people, I got people with me. And I'll never forget this. When I first started out in the ministry, my sister Geronda got very upset with me. She said, you ain't even got off the ground and you're trying to pull people with you. She said, how are you going to pull somebody up and you still in the ditch yourself? But I'm loyal. So I don't want to leave the people that I'm loyal to. When the harvest is out here and God is saying, get out in the world. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You don't want to leave your mom. You don't want to leave your dad. You don't want to leave your cousins. You don't want to leave, you don't want them because you don't want them to think you think you better than them. It'll steal your harvest. Disobedience. God tells you to do something, you got to do it. Amen. Mother, pastor's telling us we got to cut it off. Come on up here real quick and tell them what happened. Just, this is a great example. Pastor, can you give her your mic? Of somebody that was obedient. I want to tell you how good God is, and I thank God for just being good. I thank God for being under this teaching, Pastor Skip and Pastor Melba, and all the other pastors that are here. Because when Pastor Skip started this, this uh, series, I sat and I kept saying, Lord, he's he preaching on sowing and reaping. I give my tithes. I give to Melba here in the ministry. And I do everything I think that I need to do. But, Lord, I want to receive a harvest too you know so many times you did it so long you don't think about the harvest you know you don't think about you just giving but I want to receive a harvest and so many times when I walked in they said being debt free the so, Lord I'm getting older I want to know what it feel like to be debt free I just want to know what it feel like to be in some of these positions like rich and all of that I just want to know what it feel like you know so I just thank God how Pastor Melville had been, and been teaching and, and Pastor Skip and everybody been teaching and giving affirmation and all that stuff. So I said, Lord, what do I do? So God laid on my heart on Mother's Day. I went to the dollar store and got a handful of cards. And I said, Lord, now what do I do with this? He said, just give them out. I started at my house. I gave everybody that was a mother and had children, I gave them a card. Then I came to church and everybody I thought that I give them a card and I put something in there, you know. So I thank God for that. So when Father's Day come, uh, I did the same thing. I went to the dollar store, got a handful of cards and I was passing them out to everybody, you know. And I kept saying, Lord, I said, I'm giving. And on J July the 14th, I tell you this. July the 14th, my husband went to the mailbox, picked up the mail, and he told me, he said, sit down. I said, what you want me to sit down for? He said, I'm going to read something to you. 
And I said, what you got to read to me? So, you know, so I sat down. So he began to read this and said, you know, your loan you had has been audited. And I said, audit? Now, you know what audit means. You could be in your favor or it could be against you. <laughs> but then he said, it's been audited. Over $100,000 loan that I Over had. Over $100,000. He said, it's been, it been audited. And I had no, I had been paying it every month. But I would always put a little extra on there. You know, like you pay a little bit more extra. But he said, he had, as he read it, he said, it been paid. He said, you got enough in your escrow to pay it off. Yeah. Pay it off. You got enough in your escrow to pay it off. <laughs> so Glory. he said, if you want wait, it, wait, let it get it out, let it get it out. If you want it paid off, sign the paper and send it back. My husband grabbed it. He said, sign, you sign it. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed the paper, we send it in, but they paid the, 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 the loan off and send me extra money in return. <laughs> so I was so overwhelmed, I didn't know what to do. I have been crying. I said, Lord, when people cry, they not sad all the time. They happen. I cried and I thank God for what he has done. Cause truly, truly, you know what? I told God, you brought me an increase in my home. Uh, $900 a month. I said, that'll increase. So here I am experiencing being debt free. I tell you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, let me just say this and I'm closing. So you got to obey when God tells you to do something. You got to obey. You also, you got to get sin out of your life because sin will crumble the foundation of your faith. So you got to get, get, get rid of sin. Then you got to keep tithing, giving, sowing. Some of you, you've been tithing since you were little and you're like, it ain't working. Keep giving. Keep seed going in the ground. I want to show you all something. I'm put, put the picture of mom up. Put that picture up. This is my mama, right there. 73 years old, just graduated from college. You know why? Because she pushed the ceiling off. She pushed the, all the thoughts of you can't do it. All the time she tried to quit, she was like, they're asking questions, they're saying things I don't understand. I ain't been in school in so many years, I don't understand. Melvin, should I just quit? I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Had mom stopped sewing, had she stopped going to school, that day would have never arrived. Come on, let's all stand up. Woo! Come on, Pastor Skip, I'm over time. Oh, God. Let me just pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the ability to receive. Thank you that it's in your heart for us to be the generation that reaps. God, wherever we may be missing it, whether it's in sin, whether it's whatever it might be for us, each individual in this room knows. Our commitment, Father, is to position ourselves so that we can get under the law. To get under the law of sowing and reaping and to see the manifestation of it in our lives. We thank you. We praise you. And we honor you for this. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Can they get a shot off? Can they get a shot off? They do. Henderson for three. Got it! The lob. Let's go! But nobody oh, understands. The they tell you, be strong. Stay in your word. Yo, pray about it. You're going to be okay. And I'm saying, dog, do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? I'm carrying something that you don't see what I'm carrying. No. Can, can we keep it 100? 
Sis, that's we in the building. I mean, how many here, you got something so heavy that you carry it and you needed something like this to open you up to some other men that can relate to you? You can stay at the level that you're at. You get to. You don't have to pick up your cross. My God, you get to. You don't have to love your neighbor. Spit in their eye, man. Slap them in the face. See how that works out. But love never fails. You get to love them. Come on, church. We need our backbone back. We need some grit back. There are Christians that are quitting because there's no guts, no fortitude. Lazy people My don't get the dream. You gotta see this, fellas. Imagine yourself being bigger than life, but you also gotta imagine yourself doing work bigger than life. Here's the thing you gotta understand. God gave you the dream, but he expected you to work. That, ain't, that dream didn't come from you. That dream came from God. But what he expected you to do was do something with the dream to make it manifest on this earth. God never intended for you to eat, get full, and never spread the good news about how you're being cared for. You may not be in the pulpit, but you're well cared for, and your life speaks volumes to those outside the sheepfold. I'm saying, ladies, you got the power to shift your family. You got the power to shift your neighborhood. You've got the power. And I ain't seeing you move. But one thing I will do is I am fixing my eyes on the prize. And it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But I know that you're going to come through. And when you do, I'm going to be ready. You go on to tell him that he prepares a table before you every single day in the presence of your enemy. When the bugs and the flies came, he anointed your head with oil and your cup ran over. And every time you go out and come in, goodness and mercy is following you all the days of your life and you're dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. That is the gospel. That's the good news. That's what he wants your life to say. So you gotta come forth to do that. Thanks so much for spending time with us today and allowing us to come into your home and you also coming into ours. We really need your help. We would love to have more partners because partnership helps this broadcast go out to more people and we want you to be a part of changing lives. So if you could, give. Give with the understanding that this message and this gospel will go throughout the land. So thank you so much for being a partner with World Outreach and Bible Training Center. And for more information and even wanting to get this message, go to our website at www.worldoutreachbtc.org. Again, that's www.worldoutreachbtc.org. Thank you so very much.